Like I think a lot of World War II veterans, they had, they gave them these uh, wooden foot lockers, and that was kept in the basement. And you know, maybe once every year or two, he would pull it out, and he'd have the souvenirs in there. The gun he actually used was a Luger, that was a souvenir from World War II. Hello, welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, free safe space for people to share and learn from others' experiences with mental health and addictions. I'm Todd Runnebaum, suicide attempt survivor and a recovering substance abuser. Welcome to another episode. This episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Tim Lewis, and he's just written a new book called Daddy, a son's reckoning with personal and collective trauma in America. And it's about his uh, experience with PTSD and, well, America's experience with PTSD. His father killed his mother and then took his own life. And so it's, it's about that experience and, and, and the mental health effects it caused on him. This episode is also on YouTube. And if it isn't quite on YouTube, it's going to be on YouTube. It just means, uh, you know, you, you got there before it did. And that's on Bunny Hugs and Mental Health YouTube page. And before we get into the the episode, I just want to say thank you so much to Headstrong. I, I did a nice event yesterday at a school in Rose Valley, talked to students about mental health and addictions and stuff. And, and as always, the students were amazing and all the other speakers were incredible. And I just want to thank you for such a wonderful event and for, for inviting me. I also want to say real quick, I'm, we're getting so close to this this announcement about the podcast. I've been collaborating with another podcaster to, to create kind of another podcast, but it'll, it'll still be under Bunny Hugs Mental Health. But I, I'm just excited for it to happen and, and to announce when it's coming out and who it's with. But anywho, without further ado, I'm going to give you Dr. Tim Lewis. So I I grew up in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, sort of the heart of the Midwest. Uh, (laughs) Oh, the cheese fan. I know. It's amazing. After all these years, I always heard the whole time I was growing up, the Chiefs were coming back, uh, but they didn't come back in the 70s or 80s. Or 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's kind of stunning to see uh, all the attention. Um, <laughs> anyway. And, and yeah, so, uh, you know, I, in my book that that's just come out last week, it's called Daddy. I, I talk a lot about growing up. Um, and I didn't really recognize at the time, it wasn't part of the conversation that, that we were all experiencing trauma. Uh, my father was a trauma survivor. He landed at D-Day during World War II, um, you know, and he's almost 50 when he had me. So I had a much older father, um, kind of out of sync with other kids my age. And uh, my father actually started out as his secretary. Um, and so, uh, I was the result of an affair they had. He already had four daughters. Um, and, uh, my mother had a daughter, um, although she was much younger, she was 23 years younger than my father. Uh, and so I was what they now call a blended household. Um, and, uh, I was, you know, by far the baby, uh, growing up, uh, you know, with a father who, expressed a lot of rage uh directed prim- primarily sorry, gonna... at mother and sister sorry sorry i was I, there's a bit of a delay so i it's weird cutting you off sometimes but uh it, it wasn't called a blended family back then was it or was no. there a name for it no it was just kind of, well i mean the the divorce rate uh was you know really i mean my my grandparents my my mother's parents really were shocked and appalled uh, when she divorced. Um, there was a lot of rejection uh, at the time. Uh, you know, this was scandalous in the mid '60s, um, mm-hmm. and so yeah, uh, it was unusual. Uh, you know, all the kids I grew up around. I mean, there were not even that many divorces in the '70s. Uh, so it was, it was unusual. It was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. And then, uh, you're, you're talking about your dad and his anger. Yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, you know, was incredibly emotionally abusive to, uh, my mother. Um, and really nothing she could do was, was right. Uh, it was a lot of walking on eggshells when I was growing up. And so, 
none of us could really breathe when he was around. Um, and, you know, even though he, you know, because I was his only son uh, who had come along very late in life, I think he made an extra effort with me. But, you know, seeing how he was abusing the rest of my family, I could never really develop a close relationship with him. I, I just naturally sided with my, my mothers and sisters um, in dealing with, with him. And so there was a, you know, I think it, it, it grew into a really extreme sense of isolation for him. Mm. Uh, did you, you could see that he was trying to be closer with you because you're uh, the only son and then you mm. purposely you were like I don't know maybe, maybe you were scared of him or you had uh, uh, you were intimidated by him and that's why you pushed away a little bit yeah I mean it was very frightening you know I, I come to learn as an adult that in his first family that he was uh, you know quite physically abusive um, mm. and so it was you know, it, it always felt like it could spill over into physical abuse. Uh, so the threat hung over us. But I think, you know, emotional abuse, uh, a lot of people will come to me as, as new patients and say, you know, I, wouldn't, I wasn't hit, you know, there was no sexual abuse. But, uh, but then they'll talk about similar backgrounds of and this kind of uh, intense emotional abuse uh, fearing for your safety or your physical or emotional safety um, really develops kids who are, uh, you know, either want to fight back, can be very aggressive in meeting that, like my older sister, or like me, you just want to withdraw into the background and disappear as much as possible. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the, uh, whether physical or emotional abuse or a blend of the two, it, it leaves really significant star scars on people as we know. Mm -hmm. So even the emotional abuse, it, that can, could that cause, uh, I don't mean, people are throwing around CPTSD, um, mm -hmm. that around a lot and whether like, I'm not a doctor, so <laughs> maybe it's, uh, justified, but, uh, is that something you can, uh, that can be spurred into people's brains Almost from, definitely. yeah, Almost yeah, definitely. You know, I kind of circle back and diagnose myself uh, with, with complex PTSD, or it's also known as chronic PTSD, which, um, you know, is, is relatively new, you know, PTSD diagnosis didn't come out until 1980. Uh, and then, you know, there was really this issue of people, you know, there was a time frame set down with PTSD that, okay, well, you'll get better within a year. Um, but what about all those people who did not get better in a year or 20 years? And then there's an, this whole other syndrome that, that's associated with complex PTSD that's about uh, relational issues. There, there can be a really powerful fear of abandonment from these, these early scars, for example, that can make it difficult to, to be in relationships with people. Uh, that they can, you know, sometimes be uh, labeled as borderline personality. Um, is, is often an offshoot of this. I certainly, uh, in the aftermath of what happened with my parents, which I think we'll get to, um, in the aftermath of that was behaving in, you know, very borderline uh, sorts of ways, pushing people away when what I really needed most was their support. Right, yeah. I was going to ask if, uh, if, if trauma and PTSD, well, I mean, maybe not the PTSD, I because the trauma creates the PTSD, so then the trauma would also create other maybe personality disorders that our brain is kind of maybe genetically already kind of in limbo waiting for trauma to happen so that it can create something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> That's fine. <clears throat> but but what, what, do you, what do you mean by limbo? Uh, what, what point uh, are they in limbo? Well, I mean, I mean you're, you're predisposed with your DNA to maybe – um, have, you know, it's, it's a, it's a combination of, um, nature versus nurture. So, oh. so is the trauma is obviously the, the nurture part, but the nature part, you're, are you predisposed to some of these 
uh, personality disorders and then, you know, that's all. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. So, yeah, certainly they, they found genetics plays a strong role in depression, for example. Um, and, you know, there's also the concept of, of intergenerational trauma, which is getting mm. a bit more attention. I think the you know, some of the science is still out on that, the hard science. But, you know, there is evidence that, you know, that, for example, uh, Holocaust survivors, that their children, uh, you know, have uh you know some imprinting in their dna from from that experience um and you know as a culture too i think uh you know having experienced uh trauma of the holocaust and then the entire history of magwams and uh pogroms and so forth so uh yeah i think that there's there's you know intent you know growing interest and in study in how um these things can be passed down to us on a, on a, a biological level. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And so then you, you hook that up with, like you said, nurture and, you know, it's like adding fuel to the fire. So, um, so that, you know, mm-hmm. I think that's why, you know, a lot of people have different reactions, you know, somebody who grew up in, you know, an em- emotionally or physically abusive household, you know, they're not all going to develop, um, complex trauma or PTSD, mm. um, you know, in reality, only a small percentage, but, but nevertheless on a, you know, a, you know, a scale of the population of the U S it, it's a large number. Right. Yeah. So, so what is the difference between, uh, say complex or, um, yeah, complex PTSD and say just mm-hmm. trauma coping or trauma bonding, or mm-hmm. is that a symptom of PTSD? bad coping mechanisms or yeah trauma bonding is a term used kind of loosely to talk about um you know two people who have had experienced um you know some type of you know terrible experience it might be trauma um you know when we're talking about ptsd or chronic ptsd there's you know a certain list uh, there's a criteria in the D- DSM and, and the ICD-10 where you kind of have to check the boxes to officially fit that diagnosis. I think right. that there's kind of a, you know, it's it's interesting <laughs> it's in researching the book, um, the evolution of the the idea of trauma. It's it, we it, now it just seems very commonplace that we talk about trauma and um, its role, and you know terms like trauma bonding have emerged. Um, but you know, going back, uh, you know, even fifty years ago, that was a concept that was really. Uh, rejected by and large by the medical establishment. I mean, it's always been a situation uh, where people who have had trauma, uh, you know, others will deny the reality of this experience. Uh, You know, soldiers, you know, from the Civil War on um, were exhibiting um, symptoms of PTSD. There was no diagnosis, but they were often called cowards or shirkers. Um, and, you know, as we, you know, I think people are aware, a lot of times these veterans were just kind of left to, to deal with their symptoms on their own. Um, I, I'm thinking more. So if, if somebody has gone through a, a, a pile of trauma with their family, abusive parents or whatever, um, and then they, you know, as an adult, they're having trouble with addiction and they have, you know, generalized anxiety disorders, they have low self-esteem would that be considered CPTSD or is that just, um, you know, symptoms of trauma? If that, I think it depends on the, the severity and right. um, okay. depth of the symptoms. I mean, everybody experiences, <clears throat> you know, a range of emotions and challenges. And I think that, you know, in terms of uh, CPTSD, uh, you know, people are, you know, often find themselves stuck in these feedback loops um, where they're reliving um, memories of what happened or really stuck in, you know, regret, um, pain, grief uh, about something that happened, you know, 20 years ago. 
<clears throat> as I talk about in my book, um, you know, my parents went on, to, um, you know, when I was 28, my father um, actually uh, shot my mother and committed suicide. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I was the, the only other person in the house when this happened. I was downstairs. And so, you so know, you heard this, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Heard the shots. I didn't, I didn't realize at the time they were shots because there'd never been shots fired in my house, but my, right. okay. my father had guns around the house and I knew that, um, I had worried that this was a possibility, but since he'd never, you know, I'd never seen him physically become violent. Um, you know, it, it seemed like, you know, you just don't know. You kind of know, I talk about in the book, and don't know. Um, and so hindsight's twenty twenty, and I see all the signs there so clearly now. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, I think that experiences like that can, you know, in my experience of it is that I really became trapped in this this experience and uh was not able to move on for many years and so then in trying to deal with those those symptoms like repeated memories uh extremely low self-esteem uh very pessimistic um as i mentioned earlier this can manifest in cps ptsd in terms of relational issues uh you know, I, I, after a certain point, people couldn't handle me because I was, was so deeply depressed. Um, I was over medicated by a psychiatrist, um, at the time and, uh, people really pulled away after the first couple of years. And I think that can be another hallmark, uh, with CPTSD, um, you know, eventually you, you wear a lot of people out, um, over the years. Mm. Um, I think when a crisis happens, like with PTSD, uh, you know, people hopefully, you know, people are more apt to rally around. Um, but, but yeah, I think, you know, in in my practice, it's, it's my focus is working with people with CPTSD and, you know, I see a lot of isolation. Um, as a result of, uh, you know, living with these, these symptoms. Um, uh, did you have sleep issues too? I know that's kind of a common issue. Nightmares, certainly in PTSD. Yeah. Uh, and I, I slept uh, a lot and I see that a lot in my patients too. Uh, it can be an escape, uh, from everything that's going on. And, you know, a lot of times you'll be put on medications like I was. Um, and I think, you know, don't get me wrong. I think medications have, can be helpful. I'm, I'm still on an antidepressant, uh, which I've been stable on for many years. Uh, but yeah, I, I was over medicated. And I think you were talking about the nineties here too, where psychiatrists really over prescribe things like Xanax and Clonopin. Uh, that can, you know, on using it two or three times a day can turn somebody into a zombie. Mm-hmm. So how did your father go from, uh, I'm assuming he had probably complex PTSD and probably mm-hmm. just regular PTSD as well. How did he go from, how did he take that jump from being uh, verbally abusive to murder and suicide? Was it pro- that was it progressive or was it just an instant like kind of a? No, there was jump. no waving guns around. I think you know he was uh, seventy six when this happened. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, the years took their toll. That uh, he felt increasingly isolated. We you know wanted him to to get help. Uh, we never did anything to set up an appointment. <coughs> uh, and, uh, sorry, what year was I, that? Uh, uh, probably a couple of years before this happened. Uh, but, so what, what year did it happen though? What year did it happen? 90, 1993. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's come a long way. It's been a while now. Yeah. And it's been a while, you know, it's taken me a while to even think that I could write a book about this. It was not something that I I imagined being able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But you were talking about, you were trying to maybe get him some help, but 91, I mean, that was not a lot of people were, that wasn't even a, you know, it wasn't a common thing like it is now people seeing therapists and counselors and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So well, I, you don't yeah, have any guilt issues like, about well, that, you, No, I, I, I don't, I don't feel guilty about okay. it. Uh, I, I feel regret that certainly that, that things turned out the way they did. Right. Uh, right. I, you know, so, I mean, it's, I was very close to my mother and, um, you know, it's, she was relatively young when this happened. And, um, you know, I be, I talk in the book a lot about domestic violence and, um, you know, I didn't, didn't really frame that at the time that, that we were this family affected by domestic violence, which is, you know, really so common, but often so hidden, um, Mm -hmm. in our culture. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people are growing up under these circumstances or have, have lived through them and have moved on. Some people go on to repeat this, this abuse that, you know, as they say, hurt people will go on to hurt people. And <clears throat> certainly not all do, but I, I talk a lot in the book about, you know, what, what is it? What, I think that's what you were trying to get at. What, what was this extra thing? What happened that, pushed my father over the top. Uh, and I, I think, you know, it was just a collection of, of issues that, that built up over the years. And I think he held a lot of very uh, rigid ideas about masculinity, uh, <clears throat> uh, that he was this very kind of traditional, I, I, I provide and, you know, everybody does everything else and you should be uh, you know, so grateful for me. I mean, he provided, you know, a very nice middle-class uh, lifestyle for us. Uh, he was a contractor. He came from a very poor background. He lost his parent, both parents, um, when he was a teenager. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, he really was remarkably able to build that identity. Um, but really had no idea about what was involved with the kind of the emotional labor of, of being in a, in a healthy relationship with people. Mm-hmm. And I was just talking to someone else the other day. I can't remember who it doesn't matter. I talked to a lot of people, but about uh, war veterans, world war two veterans that like never talked about the war. Like they came home and it was just off limits. Like we do not talk about this. Uh, and I mean, I can't think of a more harmful way to deal with trauma than to just not talk about it. And so then, yeah, it comes out in other ways, anger or drinking or, uh, abuse and yeah, uh, that's horrible. Uh, but at the same yeah. time, I mean, that's, I'm, I mean, your dad fought on D-Day, like he helped free the world. Like that's amazing. So I'm sure, I'm sure that sat over him too. It's like, I'm a hero for God's sakes and my wife burnt my eggs, you know, and then that could be, I don't know, like, I'm just trying to put my yeah, the mind in that kind of thinking. Yeah, come from that too. Yeah, I think he could be very narcissistic. Not that he doesn't deserve, uh, yeah, the recognition for the, the bravery, um, yeah. you know, and you know, quite honestly, these guys didn't have a choice. I mean, well, they, yeah, that's right. they were drafted and that's, that's where they were sent. And, uh, you know, in researching the book, I mean, the slaughter, uh, uh, that he witnessed and 30% of his unit did not come back. Uh, so, uh, he did not talk about that. He had this, uh, like I think a lot of World War II veterans, they had, they gave them these uh, wooden foot lockers, and that was kept in the basement. And you know, maybe once every year or two, he would pull it out, and he'd have the souvenirs in there. Um, mm. The gun he actually used was a Luger that was a souvenir from World War II. 
Um, mm. and, but he had a Nazi flag in there, you know, some hand grenades. Um, and, but he never, he never had the language to talk about this. And I think it was probably too horrific that I think, you know, part of it is that they don't talk about it because they don't want to horrify you know, their family, they don't want to expose them to that. But yeah, the silence of, of dealing with this, and I think sort of the the generation he's from trying to have this, this mask of kind of hyper competence, being in control, the man, uh, it can crush people. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe the, the expectations are, are so wildly unrealistic. Uh, so I have a question. What was what was your dad's relationship with his dad? I don't know because mm. his father died. I, he was about 14 years old and uh, I believe it was a heart attack, but oh, it was another okay. thing that he didn't talk about his childhood. Uh, he never talked about his mother. She died when he was about 20. Mm. Uh, and so I, I just have, in trying to research the book, I have to resort to census data um, to really kind of piece together, you know, going who my grandparents were, who my great grandparents were, and uh, you know, it, it, it yeah, it, it's kind of almost lost to the mist of time. Um, mm. But I, I piece together enough and enough family stories to get the idea that my father was himself, uh, I believe, abused by his father. Um, I believe he there was a lot of emotional neglect growing up. He was, you know, he, when he did talk about himself, it was kind of like he was this um, kind of scrappy troublemaker um, who was always pulling practical jokes. But, you know, you, you, kind of uncover a little bit, you know, why, why would a boy be reacting that way? And I talk about in the book, I had like somebody like that, that was with me through all elementary school who, you know, it was very obvious he was being abused at home. He would, you know, kind of come up behind you and slap you over the ear. Um, You know, kids just don't react violently for no reason. And Mm. I don't, you know, I don't think he would, was acting out for no reason. It's also made Mm -hmm. more challenging because he was an only child. Um, So by the time I came along, by the time my older sisters came along, there were no witnesses to his childhood. And I think he wanted it that way. I think that was, he liked to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, You kind of mentioned the word narcissistic. Uh, a little while ago there do you think he he maybe had some narcissistic traits or undiagnosed oh yeah i think most definitely but i think they were think about it as kind of a defense of of how small and vulnerable he felt so Mm -hmm. a lot of times people can puff themselves up uh for the world to make themselves appear much bigger because they feel so small inside Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've talked to a couple of people diagnosed with uh, NDP on here, and it's always interesting that um, when you think of a narcissist, you think of someone that's very, you, you kind of mix up narcissism with like um, being vain, but it's actually just a huge mm-hmm. lack of uh, self-esteem. And so they have to overcompensate for it and stuff. So, yeah, it's very interesting. And it's usually, well, what the other people I've spoke with anyway, it was kind of a trauma based triggered the the uh personality disorder so yeah it's kind of fascinating yeah. really yeah. and the price of living with that i i think that they they feel a lot of pressure to to keep that that up either consciously or unconsciously and so it can erupt in a lot of irritability anger being very touchy uh, like my father was, it can, you know, it's kind of sometimes the, the, as narcissist, it takes very little to, or to nothing to, to set them off. Right. Right. So now that you, you've written this book and you're a psychologist and you've done a bunch of healing, uh, as someone who's 
who's also, you know, I've, I've gone through, oh, suicide attempts and, and addiction issues and stuff. And do Ooh. you feel like you're maybe healing or stopping the, the generational trauma and you're therefore you're healing like the whole next line of lineage uh, of, of your family tree? Today's episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health is brought to you by Co-op. I've been a member of my local co-op, Sherwood Co-op, for, oh, about 25 years, I think. My co-op is one of more than 150 local independent cooperative associations in more than 600 communities across Western Canada. Co-op is a different kind of business. It's not just a gas bar or a grocery store, although co-op is those things too. At its core, Co-op is a group of people working together to help their neighbors and build their community. Co-op members are owners and success is shared with everyone. Your co-op doesn't benefit one person or one corporation. Your co-op was built for everyone. Your co-op was built for your community. Learn more about Co-op and find a location near you at coop.crs. One thing I've learned through my experience with mental health and addictions is you never know what you need to hear until you hear it. Make sure to rate and review on Apple and to tell as many people as you can about the podcast so others can hear something they need to hear from one of my guests. After all, this is a free mental health service, which is a rare thing, so why not share with as many people as you can? I well, actually, do you have so. kids? <laughs> I yeah I have I I'm actually gay I have an adopted daughter. Oh okay. Um, and uh, yeah so yeah I certainly think about my role and how I treat her, uh, you know. And I talk about <clears throat> in my book too. My my grandfather, my uh, mother's father, uh, was was a victim of of. Uh, a lot of physical and emotional abuse when he was growing up. And he was this very gentle man, uh, very warm, very loving. Uh, and so, you know, it, it that was an important question for me is how do people, do they make a choice? Like, I'm never going to be like my father. Um, I'm never going to do that. Uh, you know, and I think you know, a lot of times that is the case that if you've been through this, then a lot of people swear I will never let somebody else feel that way again. You know, unfortunately, a small subset of the population, um, they they are, are so pulled into that that they just just repeat the pattern for a lot of different reasons. But mm -hmm. yeah, I I have been healing for many years now. It took, you know, the better part of 10 years to get um, more on track. Um, I, you know, in the that 10 years, I, I talk about, you know, using a lot of, uh, I was drinking, I was an alcoholic, I was popping a lot of prescription pills. Um, and, uh, and so it, as you probably know, it takes time. You got to strip that back before you can then deal with, you know, the actual stuff that you're responding to. You know, it is self-medicating, I think, in so many situations like my, my own. Um, you're just trying to deal as best you can. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I had a lot of therapy. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it was a lot of lifestyle changes, too, in terms of, you know, over the years, going back to school, going to graduate school after this. Um, you know, I didn't start until my late 30s. I was, in no, I was in no condition to be able to do it before that. And so being able to, uh, to use myself in new ways, um, to be able to help people, to learn about psychology and uh you know what may have been going on with my my family to learn about how people tick um how how we work um learn about ideas like that it really uh helped to orient me and ground me um to a place where i was able to um set my life up in a way where I, you know, I now have a you know, very stable long-term marriage. Um, I have a good career. Um, you know, in some senses I've been very lucky with the timing. 
of this, you know, going back 50 years, who knows what might have happened? Um, you know, I got a lot of good help, um, a lot of help that, you know, may have made things worse at the time. Like I talk about the psychiatrist and the over medication. Um, but, but yeah, I, I have been lucky, but I've also worked very hard to, um, to put my life into, you know, something that, that I feel proud of that have some meaning and joy. Um, and so that's, you know, also what I really love helping people to do, uh, because people dealing with trauma, they, they recognize in most cases how bad things are, how, how, you know, they're, they're recognizing how far they are from how, you know, they, they want their life to really be. And that's incredibly depressing. Uh, because you, you're feeling like, how do I get, how do, how will I ever get to, to these things that I dream of? And so, um, you know, the layers of, of problems that, that accumulate over an, an initial trauma can be so powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and to go through, like, I'm assuming for you, you went through a traumatic event plus the CPTSD. So you had to deal with kind of both. You had to deal with a very tragic event and then also deal with this complex PTSD of, you know, the, uh, the abuse and the mental abuse and emotional abuse. Um, did your father know that you were gay before he passed or, or was that something you he knew, but it was not something we ever discussed. Uh, my mother was kind of the, the mediator. Um, and, uh, you know, that was something I think they discussed and I discussed it, you know, openly with my mother. Um, and, you know, I brought friends around and people I was dating, uh, from time to time. And, uh, you know, I think it surprises a lot of people that there was not sort of a, an active pushback on his part, which I think it also speaks to like this privileged status that I had with him. But I think I, it, it must have affected him deeply. I think at the end, he felt like an utter failure. Mm. Um, his, his family didn't love him. Um, he'd done so much in his life, um, you know, in terms of building his, uh, construction business and, you know, the issue of, you know, the being a veteran, um, and having fought, um, I think he felt completely unappreciated mm -hmm. and, um, that, that's the real tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm picturing like I have a, an image in my head of what your father, the kind of person he was. And I'm thinking of a rough and tough construction worker who fought on D-Day has nothing but daughters. And then he uh, finally has a son and you guys can't have this connection. And then later in life finds out my, you know, his son is gay and, and yeah, I mean, which is, you know, obviously no problem, <laughs> but I'm thinking back in that generation and that kind of thinking. And uh, yeah, I could see how, yeah, it's another failure. Yeah, yeah. But and I let me let me add, I was not the most functional person at the time when this happened either. Uh um, okay. you know, I I had, you know, I was getting by waiting on tables and you know, I'd gone to college. They very, you know, I was very lucky to uh that they sent me to college and um but I I was yeah, I was not in a place to be able to really uh build a, a, a good life in the years leading up to their deaths. And, mm. you know, I was also dealing, this was the time of, of AIDS. And mm -hmm. so while this was happening with my parents and after their death, I was also losing a lot of close friends. Right, uh, right. You know, even though we were only like 30 at the time. Yeah. So that's, I think, just to quickly, I hadn't said that before, but I think CPS, CPTSD is this layering on of traumas over the years. Um, and so, 
Uh, I think that's another thing that distinguishes it from just, you know, the, the traditional idea of PTSD. Right. Um, and so, you know, people are dealing with layers and years of, of different types of trauma. Mm-hmm. Which, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming everyone on Earth has some form of trauma. You know, some sort of complex drama. Being human can be traumatic at times, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of, in my brain, I look at it as more like there's a acute trauma and then there's, oh, what's the opposite of acute? The opposite uh, of acute. Yeah. 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 It's like sudden know, like- or like this stretched out kind of. Oh, yeah. Okay. So they talk about that. Yeah, there's a word for that. There's like shock trauma where like if you're in a car accident Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, there's some single event like a fire and, uh, you know, you you see people maimed or burned. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then there's- School shooting uh, or something. Right, exactly. Uh, that's a shock trauma, like a single incident. Uh, most trauma is, you know, uh, more subtle than that. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it is an accumulation of uh, emotional experiences. Sometimes it is a threat of, you know, regular threat of violence. Um, living, exactly. um, you know, I think with well, yeah, I mean, we could go on and on here, but yeah, there there are. There's the, the shock trauma, and then there's the kind that, that add up, accumulate. And then there's the generational, which is, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to see that you are well and healthy and functioning as a uh, person because you've gone through so much. Your family's gone through so much. Uh, are, are your siblings? Um, in the same boat as you or some of them still dealing with, with Mm -hmm. long-term PTSD. It's a mix. Yeah. It's a mix. I think we, we all carry this, this, this weight. And, uh, you know, I think the, the healthy of the healthy ones are, you know, it, it becomes, it takes less and less of a central place in your life as the years go by as it should. Um, mm-hmm. that you're able to kind of look up from that, you know, that trauma, that experience that that's everything and, you know, build a life. Um, you know, my sisters are uh, generally, yeah, from four to, to 15 years older than me. And so um, they were at different places in their lives when this happened. And I think, you know, the sister that I'm closest to, she had already had children and a family. And so, um, Mm. you know, I think uh, having had some of those things in place um, helped to, 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 to stabilize a a bit more uh, compared to me, who was just kind of still out there in the wilderness um, when this happened. So it, so yeah, they've already, like you said, you kind of affected some of your relationships and things and they've kind of, they were already somewhat settled with Mm -hmm. partners and stuff. There's also not a huge tradition about, you know, we talked about this a lot when it happened, but, uh, you know, I think the drift over the years has been to, you know, not really talk about it much at all and so this is this book has you know really kind of stirred up a lot and there's you know generations that have been born now in my family um that that you know weren't alive when this happened and you know are now young adults so um so yeah it's 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 going to be interesting to see how this plays out as they they read it oh so you 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 haven't even seen the full kind of results no. in your family by opening up this I, wound. Yeah, I've kept it pretty close. I've kept it pretty close. I started in this writing this in 2017 and then yeah, there's been yeah, several mm. years of uh, you know, trying to 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 get this project actually out there. Right. Um, after oh, the, the writing was actually done. <laughs> well, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that plays out with your family, I guess, and what kind of feedback you get from them. Or do you think there's some of the the younger family members that had no idea this even happened? They know it happened, but it it was never really discussed. Uh, I don't think that it was, 
uh, talked about it in any detail. I think there's an avoidance of mm. wanting to talk about something so horrible. And I think that uh, we, while we kind of understand or each have ideas about why he did it, um, you know, I this book was really a process for me of becoming uh, more clear about what what might have been happening for him um, that that you know built up and up and up uh, to to end in such a horrific um, act. Mm-hmm. And I suppose, like, I mean, there must be a lot of, or maybe there wasn't. Uh, shame attached to this too. Like if, 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 you know, you talk to someone whose father was a murderer, there's probably a lot of shame in that, but it was also, you know, you're it, yeah, it's man, it's, it's a complex thing having, you know, this trauma in your family because you have empathy for your dad, but at the same time, you're, you have resentment towards your dad because he also took your mom and it's, it's, oh yeah, yeah, it's. Yeah, uh, it's weird. Yeah. The photographer came by here. They were doing an article in, on me in the San Francisco Chronicle, and the photographer came later after the reporter, and he's kind of reading this work order, and he's it's a synopsis, like a two sentence synopsis of the book that's saying, you know, very, <laughs> uh, and he's saying very casually, you know, f- you know, his author, he fought, you know, his father committed his murdered his mother and committed suicide i'm like oh my god um you know and it's just <laughs> it, it, there is a way you wrote I wrote the book I, but it was still shocking for you to hear it yeah and there is still that shame because it it can really put people off um to bring this up they don't know how to react mm-hmm. um and so of course people say oh i'm so sorry about that but then yeah i it's like oh you can't stand there and go into all the dirty details. And so it's, it's it can have the effect of pushing people away. Um, mm. So it, there can be a sense, not just of shame, but of uh, which st- I don't really have so much shame anymore, but more like I don't want to upset people mm. with this information. Mm-hmm. But I feel like, you know, in the book, it's it's important that I ups- upset certain people that are dealing with, you know, traumatic situations and um, people who are uh, have a loved one who's dealing with trauma uh, that I, I want to bring some, I, I, as I said before, there can be a great sense of isolation if you're you're going through this, or if you're close to somebody uh, who's going through this. So I hope to tell through my story, and you know, a lot of uh, I think some new information about PTSD uh, that that people can can orient themselves a little bit better in this experience and have some ideas about things that that might help beyond what they've already thought of. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Lewis, I have a segment on my show. It's called uh, That's Some Bunny Special. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a segment where we chat about who cooperated in your mental health journey and helped fill your emotional tank when it was low. This was brought to you by Co-op. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So is there, who is there, would you say, consistently for you through all of this? Well, that that's been kind of the problem is that there wasn't, uh, and that made things a lot worse. But eventually, uh, I did find a therapist um, who's sadly passed away now, but um, who really really helped me. Her name was Molly Sullivan. She was a psychologist, and she, uh. I think provided me with an understanding uh, that I'd only experienced with my own mother. Um, there was a, a, such a care um, and acceptance uh, that really helped me heal. Um, and I, I think I was able, you know, as a result of what happened, I, I lost trust in myself and the world. And so through that one relationship, I was really able to help reignite um, some trust in myself 
and other people, which I took um, like an all good therapy. I took from that one small relationship and was able to build on um, in the outside world. Mm. And so I'm, I'm so grateful that, that I eventually uh, was connected with her and was able to benefit from her knowledge and really the, the art of the therapy that she performed. Mm. Is she the influence? Does she influence how you uh, talk to your clients and treat your clients? Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I've, I've gone really far in the direction of talking a lot about personal stuff in this book, uh, which mm -hmm. most therapists are, you know, really keep their, their personal details very close. Um, you know, I don't think that she um, just told me certain details about herself that, that, you know, were in just to make herself feel better. But I think that you can use certain details of your history in therapy at the right time to help people uh, feel understood, um, to, to understand the depth of the compassion that you're trying to convey, uh, to help people feel less alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very powerful having someone that's uh, in your role that has the same kind of life experience or can relate and have not any compassion and empathy because you've gone through it as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's definitely when I worked in addictions, that was a very powerful tool too, was, was, uh, people knowing that you have this life experience. And again, no offense to anybody that works as a psychologist that maybe didn't have huge traumatic events, but, um, but yeah, it, cause everybody yeah. heals differently. And for whatever reason, they, they go towards, uh, certain people for healing. So, um, yeah, anyway, I always feel bad saying that because there are some people that, <laughs> that don't have the life experience that have the, the schooling. Right. right. And there are orient like psychodynamic orientation. You, you don't really, you're kind of being a blank screen for them to project their, their thoughts and feelings about you. And that can be very, very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. No denying, but I, yeah, I've learned, I, I work in a way that that's more directive, um, you know, giving more kind of concrete feedback about things that have helped people in similar situations mm -hmm. um, because I needed that so badly. I need, I was spinning and I needed some orientation. Do, do you want to uh, just tell people where you, they can find your book? Yeah, I'm on Amazon um, and the book is called Daddy. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, you can also find me at my, my website, um, drtimlewis.com and at medium, I, I, um, have a pretty popular, um, spot, um, uh, where I do, uh, blog posts, uh, about mental health and trauma. Um, so it's, uh, drtimlewis at medium.com. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Tim Lewis. Uh, if you go in the show notes, there'll be links to his website and to his book and stuff like that. So you can go check that out. Uh, thank you again for coming on the podcast and for, for being a, a psychologist and, and helping other people now. So this coming up week, there won't be a, a, an episode midweek, uh, but there will be again next weekend. And then very shortly, there will be consistently two episodes a week. Uh, and I'm, yeah, it, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great. Please make sure to follow me on YouTube, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, and Instagram, Bunny Hugs Podcast. And if you like Facebook, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health on there as well. Uh, and please rate and review. It is so incredibly important that podcasters get those ratings and reviews. Uh, again, this is this is uh, basically a mental health service, so it's free. So anybody can access it from people suffering themselves or people with uh, loved ones that are suffering or even like students and, and other counselors and social workers that just want to, uh, you know, hear other stories. So anyway, anyway, I, I hate begging, um, but I kind of did there. Uh, but anyway, until next week, please remember to make your beds and take your meds. Bye.